Madam Speaker, Honourable Colleagues, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are on traditional and unceded territories of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. The people of these nations are the original stewards of the land that we occupy today. And it's important in our land acknowledgements to show our humility, gratefulness and respect for their stewardship by acknowledging and thanking them. When we pay our respects to the ancestors, we reaffirm our relationship with one another. In doing so, we are actively participating in reconciliation as we navigate our work and time together. I rise today as sponsor of Senate Public Bill S-250, an act to amend the criminal code sterilization procedures, and to speak at third reading. This bill proposes to amend Section 268 of the criminal code, which currently contains the aggravated assault offences. S-250 adds for a greater certainty clause to explicitly state that a sterilization procedure constitutes an act that wounds or maims a person. It also includes a definition of a sterilization procedure that states that a procedure that results in the permanent prevention of reproduction, regardless of whether it's reversible, aggravated assault carries a maximum penalty of 14 years imprisonment. As many senators will know and remember from my first speech nearly seven years ago and subsequent speeches, eradicating forced and coerced sterilization has been a key focus of my professional life. As a reminder of why I'm so passionate about this topic, it has to do with my Aunt Lucy, who I lived with and who told me her bedtime stories of her 10 years in a tuberculosis sanatorium in Fort Quipel, Fort Sand to be exact. She talked of the monsters that walked the halls at night, the experiments on the children, and not seeing her family for 10 years. I believe my aunt may have been sterilized at this time. She never had any children. I was her girl. Years later, I worked as a nurse in central Alberta and Saskatchewan, areas that had high Indigenous populations. And more than one occasion through the years, I was told that the Indian problem would be fixed when all the Indian women were sterilized. People talked to me like that because they thought I was like them. I wasn't. These, dro these words drove me literally on fire with rage and anger to law school, where I believed that if I just became a lawyer, I could stop it from happening. That was over 40 years ago. Today in my speech, I will re-highlight the importance of this bill and how forced sterilization is not simply an issue of the past, but rather one that's ever present in modern day Canada. I will also touch on the important work the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee did in their study of Bill S-250. I introduced S-250 in June 2022, following two Senate studies on the issue of forced and coerced sterilization. Several Indigenous and black women testified for the Senate Standing Committee on Human Rights. Second report, The Scars We Carry, Forced and Coerced Sterilization of Persons in Canada, Part 2. Criminalizing the act of forced and coerced sterilization was the first recommendation in The Scars That We Carry. The testimony of the nine women and the subsequent pleas to criminalize the act of forced sterilization moved me to introduce this important bill. Over the years, I've had hundreds of encounters with Indigenous women who've been sterilized or have family who've been sterilized. I carry them all with me through this important work. To give you just one example of how prevalent the issue is, I'd like to share a story with you from a few years ago when I was traveling in the West. I was checking into a hotel late at night. I was by myself. I had my suitcase. I was rolling it in, and there was nobody other than the clerk behind the desk. And I said, I'm here to check in. And she said, oh, hello, Senator. You are the Senator of Sterilization. And I replied, well, that's an area I work in. I do work on that. And I was a bit flustered. She was a young woman. She looked at me, and her eyes got really big. And she started to cry. She blurted out, they did it to me. I was really taken aback by this because it felt like she was holding it all in so she could tell me when I showed up. She cried. She, they did it to me when I was 21, and I had four children. I'm now 35, and I have a new partner. My kids are grown. I can't get pregnant, and I can't afford in vitro fertilization. I was holding her, she was holding me, and we were both crying. At the second reading for S-250, I noted, 
as have many of my colleagues who have spoken in support of the bill, that we have evidence of forced sterilization occurring as recently as December 2023. People ask me, how can this still be happening? I know Senator Wells mentioned this person, but I would like to elaborate on how this can and does happen. Meet Dr. Andrew Kataska. Andrew Kataska is a doctor who might be seen as a role model for young doctors or a highly respected colleague. He has served as president of the Northwest Territories Medical Association. He has years of practicing medicine, as well as professorships at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Toronto, University of Manitoba, and at the UBC School of Population and Public Health. He has published articles on caring for Indigenous patients and, surprisingly, informed consent and ethics. Andrew Kataska is a former clinical director of obstetrics at Stanton Ter Territorial Hospital in Yellowknife. Andrew Kataska may be emulated as a leader and a role model at the successes of his career. In July 2019, via a remote ultrasound, he diagnosed an ovarian cyst and decided that a 37-year-old Inuk woman needed surgery. In November 2021, he performed surgery to address a painful cyst on her right ovary at the Stanton Territorial Hospital in Yellowknife. She only consented to the removal of her right fallopian tube and ovary, if necessary. Andrew Kostaka removed her right fallopian tube and right ovary and then brazenly stated out loud in the operating room, let's see if I can find a reason to take the left tube. And indeed he did. Andrew Kataska removed not only her right ovary and fallopian tube, he removed her left ovary and fallopian tube without consent and left her sterile forever. A civil suit was launched in April 2021 against Kataska and the Northwest Territories Health Authority for $6.5 million. They both filed statements of defense and Andrew Kataska denied sterilizing her without consent. A year later, he publicly apologized. In his defense, he stated that his medical student heard the Inuk patient say she did not want any more children, seemingly implying that if an organ was not being used, it shouldn't be a problem if he removed it, like she didn't need it anyway. An official complaint was launched against Andrew Kataska with the Northwest Territories Department of Health and Social Services, who licenses physicians in the Northwest Territories. And a virtual hearing was held on February 10th and 11th, 2022. The Board of Inquiry found that he violated the Medical Association Code of Ethics and Professional Responsibilities. They suspended his medical license for five months, already served. He was ordered to pay $20,000 in costs related to the hearing, and he had to complete an ethics course at his own expense. The Board considered a letter signed by his colleagues as an accomplished, thoughtful surgeon who is capable of making excellent decisions when making their recommendations. Despite all this, Andrew Kataska currently practices medicine in a hospital in the interior of British Columbia. He is fully registered with the Society for, Phys for Physicians and Surgeons of British Columbia. This is just one example of how action on Bill S-250 is desperately needed. It's already extremely challenging for Indigenous women to access reproductive health care, particularly in the north and remote communities. When they do access this health care, there are some upstanding and highly qualified physicians who would like to put an end to Indigenous women needing such care by performing these sterilization procedures without appropriate consent. On April 21, 2023, after the second reading speeches, Bill S-250 was sent for study to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee. In February and March of 2024, the committee studied Bill S-250 and heard from a wide range of witnesses, including Nicole Rabbit, a survivor of forced sterilization and board member of the Survivor Circle for Reproductive Justice. The Canadian Medical Association, Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada, First Nations Health Authority, Elisa Lombard, lead counsel for one of the class actions happening across the country, the National Council of Indigenous Midwives, the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund, and the Native Women's Association of Canada all testified. Our committee also heard from officials from the Department of Justice and Indigenous Services Canada. Speaking to our committee, survivor Nicole Rabbit, also known by her Blackfoot name, Eagle Woman, urged the committee members to support this bill. 
She shared with us deeply moving testimony about her experiences and her family's experience with forced sterilization. In Nicole's family alone, herself, her mother, and her niece have all been sterilized against her will. To conclude her testimony, she drew strength from her recently departed mother and said, someone has to be accountable for the act of genocide that we Indigenous people have faced and continue to face in regard to forced and coerced sterilization. We Indigenous people have always been poorly treated and we would like it to stop and to stop systemic racism. Therefore, the recommended amendment must be stipulated in the criminal code. Our human rights continue to be violated to this day. Hearing Nicole speak with such deep emotion moved all present in the room and highlighted the critical importance of acting on this issue by passing Bill S-250. Dr. Kathleen Ross, President of the Canadian Medical Association, appeared before the committee and was fully in support of Bill S-250. She spoke to the importance of taking this issue seriously, but also touched on how amending the criminal code cannot be the only action taken. It must go further beyond just this bill. In her words, she said, the Canadian Medical Association has strongly denounced the abhorrent acts of forced and coerced sterilization. That includes surgical procedures to permanently prevent conception, any method that alters the fallopian tubes, ovaries or uterus, or any other action that is taken with the primary purpose of stopping conception permanently. These practices are rooted in deep systemic racism and discrimination. They have inflicted, as the committee has heard, irreversible harm on predominantly Indigenous women and perpetrated cycles of inequity and injustice. This dark legacy of sterilization under coercion is woven into the fabric of our country's history. Therefore, we meet today, the medical profession and members of the government, to address this inequity, this injustice. However, while the overwhelming tone of the committee meetings was supportive of the intent of Bill S-250, and all those who spoke with the committee agreed that this practice must be stopped once and for all, during these meetings, concerns were raised by witnesses and senators on the committee that the original drafting of S-250 was overcomplicated and that it might have unintended consequences, especially in cases of emergency surgeries or medical procedures resulting in sterilization. After hearing these concerns, I consulted with the Minister of Justice and his advisors, and we developed an amendment that significantly simplifies the bill while maintaining the core goal to make it explicitly clear in the criminal code that forced sterilization meeting the requirements of an aggravated assault is against the law and will be prosecuted. The resulting amendment, which was supported unanimously by the committee, greatly simplified S-250 bringing the bill from 55 lines down to 14 lines. This amended bill makes it clear that medical providers who inadvertently or through a manifestation of a disclosed risk where possible sterilize somebody during an emergency surgery are protected by Section 45 of the Criminal Code, and it is clearly targeted sterilization without consent, so it will not impact reproductive freedoms for those who wish to be sterilized voluntarily. Prior to clause-by-clause clause consideration where I move this amendment, the committee heard from criminal law experts at the Department of Justice who were fully supportive of this change and re-emphasized to the committee how this will achieve the objectives that S-250 originally set out to achieve while avoiding the c potential complications and concerns that were raised earlier in the committee process. Canada has perpetrated many wrongs against Indigenous women. Forced sterilization is one of them. Forced sterilization has been performed, justified, and sub subsequently denied for many years. I have previously discussed the role of the provinces in promoting eugenics as part of their provision of health care. Both Alberta and British Columbia legislated eugenics population control methods, which allowed forced sterilization between 1928 and 1973, and Indigenous women were disproportionately targeted for these procedures. Thank you, Senator Simons, for your speech and the deep dive into the history of eugenics of Alberta. I have also spoke about how Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario all introduced similar bills, and although they did not become law, they highlight the normalization of sterilization as population control. 
But it is, it is not just the provinces that are to blame. In many of our own lifetimes, both senators and members of parliament have advocated for forced sterilization or have failed to appreciate the severity of the issue. Hansard has consistently recorded the issue of sterilizing Indigenous women as early as 1924 and as of today, as we speak, a hundred years later, in 2024, about the last woman who we know who was sterilized against her will in December 2023. In September, just two weeks ago, the Canadian Medical Association issued a formal apology with ceremony to Indigenous peoples for its role and the role of medical professionals in past and ongoing harms to Indigenous people in the healthcare system. <coughs> Included in the harms being apologized for was the issue of forced and coerced sterilization. And while the CMA is taking important steps to address this, amongst many other issues, there needs to be a swift and serious legislative action as well. It is incumbent on us as the current occupants of these seats to send a clear message that forced sterilization of any sort is unacceptable and will no longer be tolerated. I would like to thank the critic, Senator David Wells, for his ongoing support. And I would like to thank the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, the clerks and the staff, and especially the chairs, Senator Jaffer and Senator Cotter, for shepherding Bill S-250 through all the required steps. I would like to thank my office, Sky and Veronica, and I want to thank all of you and all of my parliamentary colleagues in the other place that have been so incredibly supportive. This bill has been a culmination of a lifetime of work, not just for me, but for so many people who I've had the honour to work with over the years. But as I have done every time I have spoken about this issue in the Senate, I would like to thank the women who have trusted me, the women who are watching, those who have telephoned me, the women who have emailed me or found me in person to tell me their stories, and the courageous women who have come forward to provide testimony. For the ones who haven't been able to come forward yet, please know it's becoming easier with each step that we take. I encourage you and others to keep contacting me. I will always listen and help where I can. As senators, we must use our platform to fight for those who do not have a voice and strive to restore their reproductive futures. Through Bill S-250, we can take a step towards eradicating this blatant violence. Let us come together to be on the right side of history. I hope that our chamber will pass this bill expeditiously and that the other place will give it the prompt attention and consideration it deserves. The women are waiting. All our relations. Marcy Megwich, thank you. Merci.